John's study of James chapter 2, he asks, If the critical text of James 2.20 is accepted, faith without works is considered useless, but regardless of the reading in verse 20, James is implying this uselessness of faith without works by calling into question its benefits. James, however, does not insinuate that faith without works cannot give eternal life. His interest resides in, a, in pragmatic matters, useless in a pragmatic, practical way with fellow believers and the rest of the people of the world. He has prepared for the thought of a useless dead faith in James 1, 26 to 27. In those verses, he faulted a devotion to the Lord that he did not control the tongue or care for the needy. So what value is that to fellow human beings? He concludes that this one's religion is useless to that effect. If a Christian does not bridle his tongue, is that reason to question his conversion? Said politely, such an interpretation misses the point. James is declaring that religious devotion that does not act mercifully to the need, needy or does not speak mercifully to others is devotion that is impractical. <clears throat> it is valuable to return to the themes of the epistle introduced in the opening remarks of the book, after James reaffirms that endurance can mature our faith, he admonishes us to ask God for the wisdom we lack, but we must ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. This context, there is no impression in this context that those who lack faith in prayer are false Christians. To the contrary, the terminology identifies an immature believer still a believer. While the readers trusted God for their eternal life, they doubted his, he would give them wisdom. The reason of this lack of faith is that the believer's life becomes unstable and immature. This theme of immaturity is carried further in 2.5 of James, where James affirms that the economically poor believers are rich in faith. This tacit contrast is between a poor, weak faith and a rich, mature faith, and not a true faith and a false faith. Finally, the elder as a righteous man can offer a prayer in faith for the sick. To do this is to offer a prayer that works. Once again, it is ludicrous to suppose that James contrasted a prayer offered in true faith with some sort of prayer offered with false faith. How do you, how do you believe in Je Jesus and not believe in him? But he does not imply that not all Christians are able to offer such mature, powerful prayer. All of these factors lead to a single conclusion. Dead faith for James is an immature, weak faith and not a false faith, as so many have supposed. Conclusion. We have discovered three central lessons in this passage. First, speaking our faith without doing our faith cannot meet practical needs. It is easy for us to talk our faith, of our faith, yet not do it. The word of there should probably be there. We are sometimes of the opinion that we have talked about it, we have done it. If we have talked about the crisis pregnancy center and our standard against abortion, we think we have done it. We gather together in a prayer meeting and talk about prayer, so we think we have done prayer. We talk about evangelism, the poor, and other issues, yet we still avoid the effort of acting out on our faith. The end result is a self-deception about how well we are doing in our own dedication to God. <clears throat> you talk about it, but you don't do anything about it? You're not doing anything. <clears throat> there is one group of Christians who are most susceptible to the self-deception talking our faith and not doing it. Notice that immediately following James 2, 14 to 26, James directs his attention to the subject of the tongue. In the very first verse of this new unit, he describes the ones who most easily fall prey to talking faith but not doing it, teachers of biblical truth. The irony of this is that we evangelical teachers and preachers who need to learn this truth most desperately are the ones who have obscured it the most by reducing James to a theological treatment of the nature of faith. It is easier for us all to avoid the real unsettling challenges of James to help others like the poor. Even my own writing on this obligation to move beyond merely talking our faith does not go beyond talking my faith. While I may find a sense of fulfillment from the Lord in exhorting others to do good works, I am not by that writing and teaching released from obligation to be engaged in good deeds in myself. And second, Faith that is invisible can be seen through good deeds. You can see a person is trusting God by their works. If we do not see the good deeds, he or she may still be a Christian, but his or her faith is not visible. Yet when good works are there, we can say, yes, I can see that that person is trusting God. Third, when works are added to our faith, our faith is, in Christ is matured. We cannot move on to maturity until we actively participate in meeting the needs of the unfortunate, such as the care of widows and orphans. 
The way that I energize my faith, then, is to act on the real thrust of James chapter 2. I must add to my faith the good works that will meet practical needs. Thank you, John Hart, for that.